Let's begin. Welcome everyone again. So most of you sent your group names. We will have those printed out and laminated, uh, hopefully by next uh, Tuesday. Okay, and you'll put them on and uh, keep them with you. But for now, I'd like you to still use your name tags, even when we get the group names, because I'd still like to get to know you uh, by name, personally. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Last time, we left off by this motivating example uh, about a fire in California that ended out hurting a couple of firefighters and the team at NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, a great place to seek a job at, okay? not affiliated with them, but I have several colleagues who work there and I've collaborated and visited there. It's a great place to work at. Uh, so they have this simulation code called the Fire Dynamics Simulator. Okay, so that code solves this is going to hold me, it's going to hold me. So that code ho solves uh, fluid dynamics and heat transfer. So in other words, it computes the airflow, the airspeed, the temperature of the air, how much energy is going on, the pressure, etc. And with a simulation like that, called computational fluid dynamics, you could get detailed information that firefighters could use in the future to learn about how to properly approach a building or a certain fire. Now those simulations that you saw ended up with nice blue and red and green colors designating temperature, speed, pressures, etc. At the heart of that entire simulation is a very large system of equations connecting the temperatures, the velocities, the pressures, the energy, across the entire house that they simulated. And the way that works is, you don't need to worry about the details, we will do an example of this and you will learn this technique by the end of the semester, I promise you that. But for now, see that grid that I put up there on top of that house? That's kind of roughly what we do. We split it up into smaller rooms that are just accurate enough to be able to represent reality, and we convert the governing equations, which are complex partial differential equations, into simple algebraic equations like those. Okay, this is a 1D example that we will cover uh, some of it today. And there you go, you have a system of linear equations. Okay, so what you've learned about linear equations goes beyond simple calculation of calculations of how much you owe after a dinner or like things like that. You know, there's much more to systems of linear equations. And that's why we cover them as the first unit in this course, because they will show up when we do nonlinear equations. Guess what? We're going to convert nonlinear equations. We're going to linearize them. They're going to show up in interpolation. They're going to show up in regression. They're going to show up in ordinary differential equations. They're going to show up in partial differential equations, in machine learning, in neural networks, systems of linear equations. So it's very important to know how to solve them, to master them. This is not a course on linear algebra, so your math professors teaching you linear algebra are gonna talk to you about all the theorems and the lemmas about properties of linear systems. Are they singular, positive definite, symmetry, etc.? Here, we are going to focus on solvable systems that we can solve about the techniques how to solve them on computers, not by hand, on computers. I have a few learning objectives here, some of them in black, some of them in red. The ones in red might or might not be covered, depending on your thirst for knowledge, right? If, you, if we have time and if you so desire, we will cover more topics. Every year it changes. Some years I cover certain topics, some years I don't. The slides will be available to you at all times, okay, with the extra knowledge. And if you want to ask questions about those, you're welcome to barge in and we can talk about that. But definitely we're going to cover the stuff that is in, uh, shown in black. You'll be able to define a linear equation, distinguish between linear and nonlinear equations, identify a linear system of equations, write a linear system of equations in matrix form, 
You probably know all of those by now. Identify rows and columns in a matrix. So if I tell you, give me the entry in a matrix and the first, um, on the fourth row and the third column, you know, figure out where that location is. Um, define, identify types of common matrices, dense, triangular, diagonal, um, banded, sparse, right diagonal, etc. cetera. Uh, define matrix sparsity. What, we mean, what do we mean by space, sparse matrix? It's not a space matrix, it's a sparse matrix, but, um, but and how, why, why that is important, Sp why sparsity is important. Define the objectives of a linear solver. Why, what is the objective? Are we solving the system? Are we finding the inverse? What are we doing when we use a linear solver? Uh, define the two approaches, direct and iterative methods for solving linear systems and when to use uh, each one of those. Classify a linear system of equations and identify which solution methodology is appropriate. Most of the solutions we will be using built-in tools in Python, uh, but if we start touching on the red topics, we will be developing our own codes for some of the iterative solvers. Those are more advanced solvers that typically require a lot of, uh, there are some tools in Python available for those, but they're a little advanced, so I'd rather kind of we do it ourselves. Okay, so what is a linear equation? What's a linear equation? What the heck is a linear equation? I mean, we know, right? You kind of know, but how can you describe it? Inversely? So like x equal 1 over y? Yeah. Is that a linear equation? So proportionally, ah, there you go, you got it. So they change proportionally. So if you, if you think of an equation as a function, so you have like y equal to x. Now you know by intuitively, ah, it's a linear equation. But, but rationally, mathematically, what's going on there? If you think of that equation as a function, y equal to x, f of x equal to x, it takes an input, x, does something to it, and produces an output. If the input is proportional as you change the input, so take the function 2x. If you double x, the output is going to be quadrupled, right? So that's a linear, it's a proportional change. And that's a linear equation, very simply. Now, visually inspecting equations, you can tell when they are linear. It's when the independent variables we typically call those x, those are the variables that we control independently. Okay, like distance, we're gonna take a distance from here to there, we're gonna subdivide this into 50 points. That's an independent variable, we used to call that x. The dependent variable or the response variable is the quantity that is computed based on the independent variable. So these are equa examples of linear equations here. The unknown is x and the coefficients, square root of two and three, they're constants. You know, so this is a linear equation. As you change x, if you double x, you're going to proportionally change the, the output. A, y equals c. If a and c are constants, y is the only unknown here showing up. It shows up linearly. It's not squared. It's not cubed. Nothing like that. 2u equals 5, u uh, being an unknown. I'm using different symbols for unknowns because you have to get used to that. There are more unknowns than x in the world. There will be p, t, pressure, enthalpy, uh, hundreds of other names for these unknowns. So on purpose, I'm changing the names of the unknowns, and I will change it from problem to problem just to try to expose you to the idea that, yeah, not every unknown is called x. Okay? All right. Now, nonlinear equations is where the unknown shows up in a nonlinear fashion. It's squared, it's cubed, there's a logarithm on top of it, there's a square root on top of it, so it shows up as a polynomial or under the operation of a transcendental function, okay, like exponential, logarithm, things like that. So those are all nonlinear equations. Like if I were to tell you, if I were to tell you 2x squared plus 3 equals 0, you can't just say, um, although you can say x squared equal minus you know, 3 over 2 and then get a complex number here, but it's still a transcendental function. It's a nonlinear equation. Okay, the response, if you double x, it's not going to necessarily double y or the output. And there's a oh, formal definition um, here. 
is one where the unknowns or variables show up in a linear fashion rather than being squared or under complex functions. By complex, I don't mean a complex number. I mean transcendental functions or complicated functions that are non-polynomial, uh, non-linear. <laughs> okay, so systems of linear equations are therefore equations where the unknowns show up linearly, but you have many unknowns, x, y, x, y, z, x, 0, x, 1, x, 2, x, 3, x, 4, and so on. Okay, you could have many, many of those, all right? Systems of linear equations, da, are ubiquitous in science and engineering, that's why we're learning them. In computational fluid dynamics, specifically like the simulation I showed you earlier, these linear systems are used to solve for the pressure, temperature, a bunch of other quantities. They're super, super important. And guess what? We have to solve a system like this at every iteration. And if you're computing the airflow as it moves from the door to the other door, you're taking so many iterations, we call those time steps, at every iteration you need to solve that system of equations. So even if the solution costs you half a second, if you do it a million times, it's half a million seconds, right? That's a lot. So that's why cost becomes important and efficiency becomes important. We see all of that. Data analysis, including curve fitting, regression, involves solution of systems of linear equations. The simplest example, if you've taken um, 1703 or any kind of intro to engineering, uh, you've heard of conservation of mass. It's one of the simplest examples where system of linear equations will show up. The idea of conservation of mass, so imagine you have a bucket of water in your backyard and um, you know, it doesn't have to be, it could be in your front yard or in your sink, it doesn't have to be in the backyard. But you have a bucket of water and there's a hole in the bucket, okay? There's a hole in the bucket and then you're filling it with water, right? So water is coming in, but then some water is coming out of the hole, right? So there's a balance between how much water is gonna, is coming in, how much water remains in the bucket and how much water is leaving. If you're bringing in water faster than it's leaving, you're gonna accumulate more in the bucket. If you're taking out water faster than you're filling it in, then you might actually just end up at barely filling in the bucket, right? So there's a balance there. If the water coming in is exactly equal to the water coming out, we call that steady state. Then nothing is accumulated, it's just whatever coming in is leaving, right? And nothing is being accumulated. This principle is called conservation of mass. Depicted here was this beautiful graphic, it says, um, accumulation, the net accumulation of water in this bucket is equal to the inputs, the inflow, minus the outputs. Kind of obvious, right? It's like your bank account, whatever you deposit, whatever you withdraw, the difference is the net balance in your account. Okay. Now, when the exact amount leaving is equal to the exact amount that's coming in, then there's no more accumulation. Okay, so we call that steady state, and that's typical of most systems of reactors or many systems of reactors because they tend to run at steady state eventually. Reactors or things in engineering, eventually they tend to run at steady state. So we'll take an example like that where a steady state is simply inputs equal outputs. Okay, so whatever is coming in equal to whatever is leaving, that is the mass conservation law that you need to keep in mind for the next couple of examples for your homework assignment as well for the exam. Okay, whatever is coming in is leaving. Okay, now in this example that I'm showing here, this is a batch reactor in chemical engineering. You're learning about that now. You might have seen it before. Um, there are three compounds existing in this network. Uh, two compounds coming in or one compound, doesn't matter. One of them is coming at a concentration C1 and a flow rate, mass flow rate of Q1. So that's, you're talking, uh, or a volumetric flow rate like uh, uh, meters cubed per second, and the concentration is like mass per unit volume, right? So it could be kilogram per cubic meters, okay? And at this point, at this pipe over here, there's, all, there's Q2 and C2 concentration. C1 and C2 are different, not necessarily equal. And then they come in and they mix, and then at the output you have a different concentration and a different flow rate, okay, Q3. At steady state, the law says inputs equal to outputs. Okay, the mass that is being input is equal to the mass that is being output. It turns out that if you multiply the concentration, which is kilogram per meter cube, times the flow rate, which is meter cube per second, you get kilograms per second. That's mass. 
mass per second, sure, but that's mass, okay? So C1Q1 designates mass, and C2Q2 is mass coming from pipe 2, and C3Q3 is the mass leaving. So the mass coming in equal to the mass leaving at every second, okay? Obvious, CQ, C1Q1 plus C2Q2 equals C3Q3, okay? So now here's an example for you to work on. I have this configuration. Uh, I have three buckets, bucket one, two, and three, all right? And I have an initial feed that is coming in, and I know that feed is coming in at um, Q1 equal five, and I call this initial concentration of the compound C01. That I know that, okay, it's 10, and I know Q1 equal five. And then this gets distributed in this network. I know the flow rates everywhere in this network. It's very easy to measure flow rates. This is a real situation. You are a process engineer. It's very easy to measure flow rate. You just put a device, you know, spins, you measure flow rate. Done. What's harder is to measure concentration, okay? Because sometimes you cannot open these buckets or these tanks, right, to draw a sample, go measure concentration. Flow rate, you get an instantaneous value. Okay, so imagine this situation. I have these flow rates, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q6, okay, Q5. So we have Q1 is known, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6 are all known. What we do not know are C1 and C2 and C3, okay? So now your task, using this mass conservation principle, inputs equal outputs, develop the system of equations that governs C1 and C2 C3. In other words, what I mean, develop the equations such that if we solve these equations, we get the answer for C1, C2, C3, okay? So what's the relation between C1, C2, and C3? There are three unknowns, so we need three equations, right? We have three buckets, which is great, so for each bucket, we should have one equation. So go ahead and try, work as groups, write down analytically, so do the balance. For each bucket, inputs equal outputs. The mass input, CQ, at a bucket is equal to the mass output, okay? So for bucket one, for example, what do you have? You have C01, Q1 coming in, but you also have what? C2, Q4 is coming in, right? And bucket one. What is leaving from bucket one is C1, Q3, okay? So that's for bucket one, All right? I'll give you the equation for bucket one, okay? Bucket one, inputs are on the left, outputs are on the right. So Q1 is an input, Q4 is an input, Q4 is bringing in C2, and Q1 is bringing in C01, Q3 is taking out C1, okay? So do the same for bucket two and bucket three. Okay, if you got the answer for bucket two, raise your hand. All right, the bearded dads. <laughs> That's one of the groups we got. Okay, hold on. So bucket two, C3 times Q2, that's an input, that's right, equal. Excellent, perfect, I agree. Okay, so whatever is coming in is leaving, all right? Bucket three. You want to take on bucket three? Okay. Okay, so inputs. What's coming into bucket three? You have something coming from, C, so Q3 is carrying C1, so you got C1, Q3, and what's leaving is C3, Q5 plus C3, Q2. I agree. Okay. So, there you have it. You got three equations and three unknowns. What are our unknowns? The concentrations in the buckets, C1, C2, and C3. So from a correctness perspective, we have as many, as many equations as we have unknowns, so the system should be well posed. Okay, closed, we should be able to solve it. All right, great. So now if I change, if I plug in the numbers that I have on this diagram, this is what I get. 50 plus 1.5 C2, et cetera, et cetera, C1, just a bunch of numbers. Okay. So now the next step, and you, again, you've probably seen this, and that's fine, so just, you know, just bear with me for a second. 
I always like, well, not me, <laughs> mathematicians, the standard approach in linear systems is always to put the unknowns and their coefficients on the left-hand side and what you know on the right-hand side because our objective is to write this in matrix form and you'll see why. Okay? So we'll take the first one. We're going to move 50 to the right and 3, 3C1 to the left. Okay? So we get that. Um, for the second one, uh, for the second equation, what do we got? So 1.5C2 and 3C2, they add up, right? So you get 4.5C2 minus 1.3C3 equals 0. And for the last one, minus 3C1 plus 3.3C3 is equal to 0. Okay, great. So I have my unknowns on the left-hand side. Keep the coefficients. You need the coefficients. They're multiplying the unknowns. You cannot get rid of the coefficients, okay? Keep the coefficients. But what's important, unknowns on the left-hand side, what you know on the right-hand side. Always, always like that. That standardizes the process. Okay. My objective now is to convert this to matrix form. So, again, you might have seen this. If you haven't, I think you do because you did so well on exam zero. But if you haven't, this is how I typically explain how we build matrix form. So, if you take now this order of unknowns, C1, C2, and C3, and you take the first equation, it, uh, you write C1, you write C2, you write C3. Okay, just put it as placeholder. You take the first equation, well, the first equation is going to contribute 3 to C1. The second equation, there's 0 times C1. There's no C1 in the second equation. And the third equation, there's a minus 3. So you write this in this vector. So you get 3C1. Okay, now for C2, first equation is contributing minus 1.5. Second equation, 4.5. Third equation is 0 times C2, right? And then the third equation, same thing. For C3, uh, sorry, for C3, the first equation has no C3, so it has a coefficient of 0 times C3. Second equation has a coefficient of minus 1.5. And the third equation has a coefficient of 3.3, okay? And the right-hand side is 50, 0, 0. Now, look what I did here. This is a single equation representing the three equations, right? How do you read this? 3C1 plus minus 1.5C2 plus 0C3 equal 50. Guess what? That's equation 1, right? 0C1 plus 4.5C2 minus 1.3C3 equals 0. That's equation 2. Equation 3, minus 3C1 plus 0C2 plus 3.3C3 equals 0. That's equation 3, okay? So this is semi-matrix form. And finally, you wrap this up into a single matrix, okay, where... It's a convention to write systems of equations in matrix form. The way I read them, when I hear the word matrix, when somebody tells me, oh, here's a matrix, a bunch of numbers in it, I immediately think a matrix is nothing more than a representation of a linear system of equations. Each row in the matrix represents the coefficients in the corresponding equation for that system of equations. Look at it here, right? If you look at the first row, 3 minus 1.5, 0, those are the coefficients of equation 1. And how do you read this? It's 3 times C1 minus 1.5 C2 plus 0 C3 equal 50. Second row is the second equation, 0 C1 plus 4.5 C2 minus 1.3 C3 equals 0. It's really... How do you get the equation? It's the dot product of the row vector by this column vector. Gives you equation one. This row vector dotted with this column vector gives you equation two. Third row dotted with the column, this column vector gives you equation three. This is important and useful because now we've standardized how we will communicate about linear systems of equations. It's going to be a matrix that contains a bunch of numbers that represent the coefficients of the unknowns. Whatever they may be, you can call them monkeys. I don't care. It's just a bunch of unknowns, right? But the coefficients is what matters. And the right-hand side matters as well because the right-hand side is going to give you the unique solution to a given system of equations. What is also equally important is, first, you need to know what your unknowns are. So on the previous slide, I had two questions at the bottom. What are the known variables and what are the unknowns? Once you know the unknowns, 
you need to decide on an order of the variables. Are you going to write them as C1, C2, C3, or C3, C2, C1, or C3, C1, C, uh, C2? I don't care. But be consistent. Make sure that you write the equations in the order that you want and stick to that order. So when we go to Python, there's no concept of C1, C2, C3, et cetera. There's only a coefficient matrix and the right-hand side. And when you provide the coefficient matrix, the order you put the equations in, the answer is going to be corresponding to the order that you chose for the variables. Okay. All right. So we call this the coefficient matrix. We're going to refer to it as A for lack of any other symbol. Okay, I'm just going to call it A. It's bold-faced, and I typically put brackets around it, square brackets, to, to insist that this is a, a matrix. Now, the C values in this column vectors, that's the solution vector. That's the unknowns. We are trying to find the values of those quantities. Okay? And finally, the right-hand side, typically you'll see me use the word RHS, okay? short for right-hand side. The right-hand side of a system of equations is always known. Otherwise, if it's unknown, it should be part of your unknowns. It should move to the left-hand side. Okay? And we call that B. And there you have it. Now, that entire system of equations is written as AX equal B. You've seen that, right? Calculus and algebra, whatnot. Okay. I hope I'm explaining it differently as an engineer would. Okay. So now our objective is to find x. Now we lost track of that problem we're solving, right? So we were solving this concentration problem. I don't care about that now. I care about the standardization of what we're going to talk about, about linear systems. So how would we find x? Check this out. This is so cool. Do the analogy with a single equation. If you had ax equal b, then you would do x equal b over a. Agreed? 2x equals 3, x equals 3 over 2, right? Well, why can't we do the same here? x equals b over a. No, we can't do that. Why is it illegal? <laughs> uh, because you cannot divide. What, what do we mean by dividing by a matrix? What the heck is dividing by, does dividing by a matrix mean? Well, we really can't divide by a matrix. For a matrix, the equivalent of division is the inverse. So really, really technically, you are kind of dividing by the matrix. But we say instead of division, you multiply by the inverse. Because x equal a over b, 1 over b is b inverse, right? So matrix inverse, just a notation. This is exactly what we're, we're doing, the same thing we do for a single equation. And is that we solve for x by multiplying the right-hand side by the inverse of b. Okay. You've heard of the inverse, I hope. You've done some even just elementary linear algebra. Okay. The inverse is awesome because once you have the inverse, you have the solution. All right. Now this gets us to the purpose of linear solvers. Okay. And this is where we start departing from what you've learned so far. The purpose of a linear solver is typically, in the context of this class, is to either find the inverse of A or an approximation to the inverse of A. Ooh. Because sometimes these A matrices are so nasty and so big, it would take 17 years to find an inverse. So we find an approximate inverse in like one hour. Okay? And the approximate inverse is decent enough and we move on with life, because that's not really the biggest problem, typically, when we are solving things. Or solve the system without actually computing the inverse. So iterative solvers do that. Some direct solvers do that. Just get to the answer without actually computing the inverse. So invert the system of equations, solve it on the fly, essentially. And that's the purpose of linear solvers. All right, so now we go back to the um, system of equations. So suppose you have AX equal B. 
The brute force approach, the simplest approach that you probably know already, is Gaussian elimination. And you just use it to compute the inverse of the coefficient matrix or just kind of solve the system. You do Gaussian elimination. I assume you've all done that. If you haven't, okay, good, good. It's like I, I, I don't even care about studying it. It's a great asset in mathematics, but we're not going to cover it. We're going to learn it. Okay. However, what's important to recognize is that Gaussian elimination, and pay attention, is a type of solver that we call a direct solver. Right? So we're going to go back. If you remember in the first slide, learning objectives, we had direct solvers and iterative solvers. So direct solvers, they solve a system of equations exactly. There are absolutely no errors beyond round off errors. They'll give you an exact answer for a problem. Okay, Gaussian elimination is an example of a direct solver. Okay? They sound so good, but they are so unbelievably expensive. We'll see more. Okay. For the purposes of this class, we are going to use built-in solvers in Python to solve most systems of equations. And in fact, unless you start getting you know, into grad school or like doing more kind of machine learning or neural networks, you really don't need anything beyond what I will explain in the next few slides. A couple of built-in tools in Python to solve linear systems, and you're okay. Okay, so let's... Python, if I, I introduced this term a few years ago, I think it's picked up somewhere. Um, so Pythonification, I actually wrote this inspired by, a, by uh, you know, like these definitions you have in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, what is it, in the dictionary, what is it? <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, to Pythonify something is to convert a mathematical formula or abstract concept into code using the um, Python programming language or the interpretation of everything in life through a Python lens. So when sitting at the dining table, Josh said, from kitchen, import dishes. For each dish in dishes, and then his mom interrupted, just shut up and stop Pythonifying our dinner, please. So anyway, so we're going to Pythonify a lot of things here, OK? We're going to turn everything into Python. All right, this is a little joke. OK. Now, there are two popular routines uh, that we will use in Python to solve linear systems of equations. The first one comes from, well, both come from NumPy. Um, there are other libraries out there. This is only a, one very common tool to use, okay? There are other tools out there. You're welcome to use those as you move on. If you discover in certain applications in your career, those could serve you better, do that. But at least as a minimum, you can use the linear algebra package from NumPy. And you get to it from numpy.linalgebra. So numpy is a big library. Inside it, there's another library called the linear algebra library. Um, the first routine is called numpy.linalgebra solve. And it looks like this. You give it a coefficient matrix A, and you give it a right-hand side vector. And guess what? It gives you an answer. It gives you x. Now, what, it, what it's doing internally is doing some form of Gaussian elimination. It's a direct solver. It's an exact solver. Only errors are round off errors, so just crunching numbers, okay? And now how do we build A and B? We will talk about that in a second, but this is what it looks like. From numpy.linalgebra import, import solve, you define A somehow, you define B somehow, and then you say x equals solve A comma B. Can be simpler, right? MATLAB, I think it was like A backslash B, something. That's the same thing. And then print x or use it whatever you want. The other routine is computing the inverse. So we get the inverse of A from linalgebra.inf. So that gives us the inverse. Then you take the inverse and multiply it by the right-hand side to give you the answer, right? So it's a two-step process. Again, you import from linalgebra import inverse. A, B, define it somehow. A inverse is equal inverse of A, okay? And then you still need one more step to do to compute x, the solution. This is just a little bit more expensive than that one because this is doing it in two steps, computing the inverse and then doing a matrix vector multiplication. The other approach is getting you the solution on the fly. It's a little bit more expensive than the one at the bottom. Okay. So the final question is how do we build the coefficient matrix and the right-hand side vector? Uh, vector? 
Very simple, for small systems, you just type it in by hand. Please do not use pandas or NumPy arrays. A simple list is gonna be sufficient because it will be readable to you as rows and columns of a matrix. Let me show you how. This is the system of equations we were dealing with. Look at that, you can simply define A by a list of lists. You open outer brackets, for each row, you put them in a bracket, 3 minus 1.50. Go to the new line, 0, 4.5 minus 1.3. Go to a new line, minus 3, 0, 3.3. Don't make it harder. It's, you're allowed to do it, but you know, don't complicate it. This is simple stuff. Using pandas is like getting a bulldozer to hammer a nail, right? So it's an overkill. If you can do it simply, do it simply. This is cleaner and reads easier. Don't obfuscate what you're writing. Again, this is preference, right? And the right-hand side, same thing. The right-hand side is simply a vector. It doesn't care if it's a column or a row. Just write it like this. Python figures it out. Python knows what to do with it. So don't say like this is a row vector or a column vector. There's no trans. It just knows what it's doing. Just write it like this and you'll be fine 100% of the time. B is equal, you know, another List 50, 0, 0. That's it. That's all there is. And you can solve linear systems of equations. All right. So now let's go and do this together in Python. Run your notebooks, open them up, and let's get moving. All right. So I will move the slides here. Example from separations window. Oops. Okay, and I will get me a new Jupyter Notebook. All right. Move to Crystal. Okay. I'll, I'm going to give you a minute to just kind of try to type this up yourselves. You want to use both techniques, okay? The linalgebra.solve and the inverse, all right? So actually we can just do it together. Okay. In class coding activity one, you are awfully quiet today. All right, so from numpy dot lin algebra, I'm going to import actually both solve and inverse. All right, so I'll import both, both of those together. To import more than one sub-library, you just separate them with a comma, okay? Just like I'm doing here. So using... Um, Solve using the solve function, the solve routine, okay? So first let me define the um, matrix. So A, so I'm gonna open the outer bracket of the matrix, okay? Look at that. And then the first row is it's in its own list, 3.0, minus 1.5, and 0, 0.0. And then don't forget the comma after that's the first row. The second row, 0.0, 4.5, and minus 1.3. And then the third row is minus 3.0, 0.0, 3.3. .3. And that's it. So we close the, so it gives us the coefficient matrix. And the right-hand side B is simply another list, 50, 0.0, .0 and 0.0. .0. Why do I do it like this? Because most systems you're dealing with are going to be like 5 by 5 or 7 by 7 or 3 by 3. Just do it like that and move on. For the larger systems, that are very effective way of building those matrices. And we'll, we will see a few examples um, later. Okay? Because when the systems become large, the equations, they have a recipe, a formula. The coefficients have a formula to them. 
So we can loop to build the matrix in those cases. But for these little ones, just do it this way. All right, so we got the right-hand side. Now, using the solve routine, right, so I'll keep this up here. Okay, maybe. Using the solve routine, the x, or the result, okay, concentrations in this case, is equal to solve. Okay, let's say you forgot, you open parentheses, shift tab, and you get to see, you get to see uh, the, uh, the API, the function API, solve a linear system of equations. Okay, and it tells you the format. A and B. A is the coefficient matrix, and B is the right-hand side. Right, so I'm going to put A comma B and print concentrations. Okay. Dot, dot, concentrations. All right. This is what I got, 19.2, 5.0, and 17.4 kilo, uh, kilograms per cubic meter. Yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, I mentioned this a few lectures ago. I want to, t yes, how couldn't you listen? <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. I'm glad you keep asking these questions. So. Um, the, I want to force Python to treat it as a float, not as an integer. Because sometimes Python thinks it's smarter than you, and it will go ahead and do a division and treat it as an integer division. Like if you have 2 over 3, it might just round it. Okay? I'll give you 0. Right? So I put point 0.0 everywhere to make sure they're all floating numbers. Okay? And it will come and bite you. Like, you say, oh, yeah, I have a lot of floating numbers. What's, what's one number without a floating? It, yeah. Algorithms get really complicated when codes start growing. So just make it a practice, 0 .0, 0 .0, you know, to force it to be a um, floating point number. All right, so if we want to solve, use the inverse, using the inverse, right? So we declare the inverse uh, variable, uh, the variable where we're going to store the inverse of A. I just call it A inv and then put inv of A. Okay, now you can print A inverse and this is A inverse. Okay? So if you were to invert this matrix, this is what it looks like. Now to take A inverse and do a matrix vector product, don't do a for loop. Please, there are things built in in Python that will do it for you. The cleanest way of doing it is to simply use the at symbol. A inf at b, that should give you the result. So concentrations is a inf at b, and print concentrations. Oh, great. We got the same answer as before, right? So our previous answer using solve was that. Our answer using a inverse was this. They're equal as expected. Now that at symbol, early on when they introduced it, it didn't work on all computers, but now it should be working on your computer. If not, come talk to me after. We'll find a way to get an equivalent at symbol for you. But used in this context, this is correct. It takes the matrix and does the matrix vector multiplication correctly and gets you the answer. Okay? That's really all you need for linear systems. And I could tell you now, okay, let's stop here, no more, and we're done, okay? But I like to talk, and I like to talk more about other things that you might see as you move on in your education and in your career. Okay, let us resume with our pursuit of systems of linear equations. So obviously, what you could do for two equations or three equations or five equations, what we did just now, you could do it for an arbitrary number of equations, okay? Any number of equations. So in general, we call those variables, the unknowns that you're solving for x1, x2, all the way to xn. And in general, if you have a system of 
m equations and n unknowns, right? So you could write it this way. That's kind of the general form. And the coefficients, you start designating them. I'm going to call them all A because we're going to run out of alphabets, okay? You could use all the alphabets in the world, but you will run out of al alphabet symbols. You know, if you do a thousand equations, a thousand unknowns, right? So we start to use indexing, to use indexing. But it turns out that you need two indices for each coefficient because of the matrix, okay? Because, uh, you know, not the matrix, because of the matrix formulation of this, right? So in this setup, what I have, I have M equations, okay? There are M rows. And you can tell that just by looking at the right-hand side. I have B1, B2, all the way to M. But I only have N X values, N unknowns, okay? That's a general system of equations, okay? And alternatively, you could write this as AX equal B or this nasty summation over here, which represents that dot product. So the, to get the, to get um, the ith row, it's simply the dot product of, to get the ith equation, it's the dot product of the ith row by the column vector. That's all what this summation is doing. It's, you take the ith row, dot it with the column vector x, and you get that equation. Yeah. Entries in a matrix are referred as aij. i refers to the row, and j refers to the column. Now, this is where my amazing ability of using nomenclature comes in. So I could never remember A, I, J, what I refers to and what J refers to. Is it row or column or column or row? To this day. And I've been doing this for, what, 15, 20 years. So what I use personally is A, R, C, arc. A, row, column. Use whichever one you like. But always the first index refers to the row. The second index refers to the column. Okay? If somebody asks you, AIJ, you can confuse with AIJ, just write arc. The first number refers to the row. Second number refers to the column. So if I'm telling you A34, what is 3? Does Is it row or column? Arc. Oh, it's row. 3 is row. 4 is column. Find the third row, fourth column. That's the entry. Okay, now here's a question for you. This is a matrix. The size of this matrix is M by N. It has M rows and M columns. Okay, what is the relation between M and N for this to be a well-posed system? Why? Okay, let's build on that. You're right, but let's build on that. So. How many equations do we have? M equations, how many unknowns? N. Exactly, right? So M needs to be equal to N so that we have as many equations as there are unknowns. Otherwise, your system is ill-posed, okay? And you cannot solve it. There's no inverse for a matrix that is not square. That's why. If you think of matrices, I mean, you probably learned that a matrix that is not square is by definition non-invertible. Why? Because if you think of the matrix, of a matrix as representing a system of equations, you need to have as many rows as there are columns because the rows represent the number of equations, the columns represent the number of unknowns. So you need as many equations as there are unknowns. If you have more equations there than unknowns, there's not a unique solution. If you have more unknowns than equations, same story. There's no unique solution or maybe no solution at all. So that's why the matrix becomes singular. So for this to be well posed, M needs to be equal to N square matrices. That's what we will be dealing with. So that's a sanity check. If you have a routine, a code that's solving systems of equations, first thing you check is that if some user is sending out a matrix input, make sure that it's invertible, that it's a square matrix at least to start with. Now, the beauty of converting a system of equations to a matrix form is not only it's easier to write, but you can also reason about patterns in the matrix, right? So you look at it, it's just this beautiful block of numbers in it. You know, I don't have to carry every, every time I write equation. I don't have to carry that. I can put like three dots in between and just kind of figure out what the matrix looks like. 
But then when you start solving actual problems, you will notice that matrices come in different flavors, in different shapes, and they have beautiful patterns in them. Okay? In, in our work, when we, have, we solve typically systems like a million by a million or 10 million by 10 million, and if I were to plot the non-zero coefficients in the matrix and just put little, little pixelated squares, it looks like this gorgeous tapestry. Like I, I used to print them out and kind of hang them on the wall. They're really, really pretty. So, but you can reason about that. In general, a matrix that's full of numbers, like that one, you know, there's no specific pattern. We call that a general dense matrix. I will come back to the idea of dense density in a matrix. Um, if all the elements are on the, upper on the main diagonal and upper, then they're called upper triangular matrix. If they're on the lower, on the main diagonal and lower, called the lower triangular. If they're only on the diagonal and everywhere else is zero, so the, the white space over here means there's zeros. There's no coefficients. It's all zeros. It's all a bunch of zeros, okay? So if the only entries in a matrix are diagonal, are on the main diagonal, it's called the diagonal matrix. A special case of a diagonal matrix is the identity matrix. And one even more special case that always shows up in heat transfer and fluid mechanics is the banded matrix, when you only have a few non-zero diagonals. Could be the main diagonal, first upper, first lower, and then could be the third upper and the third lower, fifth upper, fifth lower, but you get these bands of non-zero matrices, okay? Just for you to know, right, we will touch on this type of matrix for the rest of, the, of, the, of these lectures. Okay. So what now? Here's my advice. For small systems of equations or for systems where knowledge of the inverse is sufficient, you, you know, just use the tools that we discussed, numpy.linalgebra.solve or numpy algebra inverse, inf, and just move on with life. Okay, you're good to go. We will use those tools when we're doing regression. These are easy, cheap, simple, small systems of equations. Use either one of those. Okay. In some cases, using a direct solver is generally many, is generally very expensive and inefficient. Sorry, this slide threw me off. It was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to be different. Okay, this is the line of thought here. Okay, now many cases in engineering, however, they result in very large systems of equations that are to be solved repetitively over and over and over again. Okay, so the story doesn't end here. This, for most cases that you'll be dealing with from now until you graduate, maybe in your entire life, there'll be small systems, just use these and move on. But in other engineering applications, there's an entire world where three by three is a joke. You're talking about 100,000 or a million or even 100 million equations and 100 million unknowns. These are very, 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 very large systems of equations. Okay? Examples include CFD, solid mechanics, machine learning, optimization. You'll hear if, you've ever, if you ever do neural network or if you ever read up on the literature for neural networks, you've heard of the word they use gradient descent algorithm to do their optimization. The gradient descent is a method to solve a linear system of equations. That's all there is. But it's faster than Gaussian elimination. Okay? And the reason we use it is because we just don't care about an exact answer. If we were to use a Gaussian elimination, we would be waiting until today for an answer from ChatGPT. Okay? So we need other methods because in all of those cases, the direct solver is generally very, very expensive and inefficient. Okay, so that's the point I want to make. Direct solvers like Gaussian elimination, the linalgebra.solve or linalgebra.env, they're useful for small systems. Okay, but that's it. Beyond that, we need other technologies. Okay. So here's an example from heat transfer where we can convert a differential equation into a system of linear equations. And we are going to come back to this example a few times throughout the semester. For now, what I, I want you to trust me that you can solve this problem with a linear system of equations, okay? Why we'll start kind of seeding the, the, these thoughts as we move on through the course, but we really won't get into this until we hit ordinary differential equations at the end of the semester. And then it will be you know, such a joy to recognize how to do all of that. All right. 
But for now, consider just simple heat transfer in a material. So I have here some material, could be a rod or this wall fixed at both ends. I'm going to call that x0 and x equal L. Or it could be like this here, this piece of material. And at one side of the material, I'm fixing the temperature. And another side, I'm putting another temperature. So it could be, could be the wall. On the interior, you have, I don't know, 70 degrees. And on the exterior, you have 30 degrees, right? And there's going to be heat exchange between the two, right? Now, to spice it up a little bit, I'm going to add a heat source in the middle. Fire or like, imagine you have your spatula kind of on the grill and it's exposed to air temperature on one end. On the other end, it's exposed to the, to the metal and in the middle, there's the fire heating it. Okay, so something is going on. Or you're, you have a hair dryer and you're blowing air at it. Okay, you're heating it or cooling it. Anyway, the point is, this is, this is what this problem looks like. There's going to be, if you're heating it, there's going to be heat over here. So it's going to increase the temperature in the middle. And then it's going to taper off at the ends if the temperatures are kind of, you know, lower than what this heating source would do. But it's going to look like this. Now, the equation that governs the temperature at every point in this material inside the material at every point, it's a differential equation. You're going to trust me that this is the equation that models this problem. You will learn this next year in heat transfer. Okay? But for now, it's at least good to see it because when you go to heat transfer, you're like, oh, yeah, we've seen this in numerical methods, right? You're going to be like so proud of it. And you'll come back to this code. And you know you're going you're gonna to do great. OK, so how do we solve this? And again, at the end of the semester, I will teach you exactly how you do it. We're going to split this into points like we did with the fire simulation problem. I told you we split it into grids. So what they do in practice, we just split it into discrete points because we're doing numerical methods. We're not, doing, we're not solving this exactly analytically. Okay, this is numerical methods. We're going to split it into small points. And at each point, I'm going to assign a variable, t1, t2, t3, t4 for the temperature. And my purpose, my objective, is to convert that equation into an algebraic relation between t1, t2, t3, t4, and so on and so forth. And lo and behold, you can do that very effectively. Okay? And you get something like this. Okay? And trust me that I will come back to this, and I will teach it to you. And you'll be able to derive this on your own. But for now, I want to demonstrate that you can get large systems of equations from engineering problems. Now, for this to be realistic, you probably need 1,000 points here, at least 1,000 points. If you have more complex heat transfer, you need more, more points. So this would result in a 1,000 by 1,000 system of equations that looks like this. Look at the pattern. There's zeros everywhere. There's minus 2 on most of the main diagonal and 1s on the first and lower, upper, uh, lower diagonals. Okay. It's a pattern, and everywhere else is zero, but it's a large system of equations. Okay? Now, what I did, I took this system, and this is this equation in 1D, and I solved it using Gaussian elimination or the Lin algebra dot solve and the inverse method, and another very efficient method called the Tomas algorithm. Don't worry about that, but it's a faster method. Okay? All of these three methods are direct solvers. One of them is much more efficient than the other two. This is what you get. Initially, for like 10 equations, on, so what you're seeing here, excuse me, what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the time it took to solve the system of equations. So I'm doing, I'm timing, numpy.linalgebra.solve. Here's the matrix, here's the right-hand side. Time it. How much, how long did it take? I'm doing the inverse, I'm just timing it. You know, tick, tock, OK? Measure the time. Increase the number of points, number of equations. Do it again. Increase the number of equations, do it again. So I want to see how it scales. Initially, all methods that are shown in red, blue, and black, they are the same. You know, 10 equations, 100 equations, maybe, you know, 500. And then you start hitting here, this point. And after 1,000 equations, you start seeing near exponential rise in the cost 
of the red and blue curves, which are the standard Gaussian elimination-based methods, versus that black line, which is just says like a straight line. Okay? So you could tell that even at 10,000 equations, which is nothing for practical purposes, excuse me, the, the red and blue lines, they become exponentially expensive. Now you're saying, well, Dr. Saad, this is one second or like 10 seconds, that's nothing. Sure, it's nothing if you do it once, but if you do it a million times because you're advancing in time, like what if this rod is exposed to different heating conditions as, let's say you're looking at heat transfer to you know, some piece of earth or land, and there's a, there's a diurnal cycle with the sun, right? So you're gonna simulate that over the entire day as the heat flux changes throughout the day. So you're solving this system of equations, this one second or 10 seconds over and over and over again, a million or 10 million times, then that becomes a serious issue, okay? Now, I did the same thing, but in two dimensions. In two dimensions, the same problem becomes a partial differential equation. Again, don't worry about the t's, just know that this is what it looks like. Then you have the curse of dimensionality. Everything just explodes in terms of time and cost, and this is what I got. The blue line is the Gaussian elimination that we discussed. In fact, after 100 grid points, so that's 100 by 100, that's about that's 10,000 grid points. I ran out of memory. It crashed. It told me I it just crashed. It stopped working. Now, the other methods over here, they're more advanced iterative methods. Okay, there's algebraic, multigrid, Kreislauf solvers, conjugate gradient methods, etc. Okay, to solve these very large systems. So the point is, large systems of equations coupled with direct solvers like Gaussian elimination are a bad idea. Do not use direct solvers on large systems of equations, especially if you're repetitively solving those over and over again. As you're training a machine learning uh, a neural network, you have to keep running that optimization cycle over and over again for each day as you train over the data points, right? And in every cycle, you're solving an optimization problem. It's a very large system of equations. That's why we don't do Gaussian elimination in those cases. We use other methods like gradient descent, which is the most popular one. Anyway, the cost of Gaussian elimination, again, is, is very high for large systems. Now, thankfully, you can quantify this um, uh, this is the first time I, I talk about this this year, just a couple of slides, but there's something called complexity, complexity of algorithms. You've probably heard that array sorting is order n log n, or like this algorithm uh, is order n. I don't know if you've ever heard of that in computer science circles, if you have like a nerdy computer science friend or some, you know, talk about order n. Have you ever heard that? Okay, okay. So if you haven't, um, this is the introduction to it. Computational complexity measures the actual cost of an algorithm. Like, could we have been able to tell that Gaussian elimination is, is expensive? Turns out, yes, by simply counting the number of floating point operations, how many multiplications, additions, subtractions, and divisions you're doing. The more you do of those, the more complexity your algorithm has, okay? So here's some definitions. For a, any algorithm, such as Gaussian elimination, there are two types of comp computation complexity. There's time complexity and space complexity. We start with time complexity. It's a measure of how long an algorithm would take to complete given an input of size n. So for Gaussian elimination, what is the input is the number of equations or the array size, the matrix size, right? That's your input. Just like the plot I did, as I changed the number of equations, I saw how much time, it, I tracked how much time the algorithm is gonna take, all right? Um, this is usually measured by simply counting the number of floating point operations in the algorithm. That's simply additions, multiplications, divisions, and subtractions, okay? If an algorithm has to scale, it should compute the result within a finite and practical time, even for large values of n. For this reason, complexity is typically calculated asymptotically. So if you notice in the previous plot, for small values of equations, all the algorithms behave the same. It was all in the noise. It's only when we go to large numbers of equations that we see that separation. Okay, 
So when you think about algorithmic complexity, you're always thinking about large numbers, large scale, right? Now, space complexity refers to the algorithm, to an algorithm's space limitations, okay? So in the second plot I showed you, I told you I ran out of memory because space complexity for the Gaussian algorithm is very, very high compared to the algor other algorithm because we have to store that entire matrix. I'll allude to that at the end of the course. Now, this is a graph showing the general, um, uh, the general state of algorithms and where we would like to be. So this graph is showing the operation count on the y-axis and the number of the input size on the x-axis. Okay, so you're going from very small inputs to very large inputs over here. And we designate the time complexity of an algorithm as order n, order n squared, order n log n, order e to the n, exponential n, order sine n, whatever. Okay, it's just the, we use the symbol order because we're looking at how the algorithms, algorithm behaves at infinity, at large n values of n. So ideally, we want to be in the green region here, green and yellow region, algorithms that are linear, that scale linearly, that are order n, order you know, n over 2, order 1, order log n. An improvement to that is order n log n, where you get to this kind of uh, brownish zone. But once you go beyond n log n or n log squared n, etc., you go into polynomial time. Okay, order n squared, order n cubed, and so on. And then you get into order n factorial, order a to the power n exponential time complexity. That's, those are very bad algorithms. So Gaussian elimination is order n cubed. So as n increases, there's about n to the power 3 operations being done. So 10,000 equations, that's 10,000 to the power 3 operations. Okay, as you go to, to these large numbers, all right? Um, has anyone heard of the Clay Mathematics Institute, the millennial problems, the P and P problem? You ever, yeah, so this is it, okay? Anyway, there's a, there's a big, there's a mathematical prize, um, a million dollar prize. I don't know if it's worth it now, million dollars with all the inflation, right? But, <laughs> but there's a millennial prize math problem about algorithms order p, which is polynomial time, so n squared, n cubed, and order np problems, which are non-deterministic polynomial algorithms. So you can read that up, p, p versus np problems. Just Google that, p versus np problem. It's very interesting stuff. There's a YouTube video about this. I think Veritasium has one about it. Anyway, it's worth looking at. All right, so I have five more minutes. Mm. Yeah, I'll let you go.